Hello, I'm Terence Maloon. Welcome to this part one of a two-part lecture about Paris, City of Spectacle. Here is where you go in Paris if you want to study French art of the 19th century. It's the Musée d'Orsay. The Musée d'Orsay is the former Gare d'Orsay. It's a railway station that's been converted into an art museum. And it was the last of the railway stations built in Paris. It opened in 1900 in time for the huge and spectacular Universal Exhibition of 1900, an exhibition visited by some 50 million people, one of whom was the 19-year-old Pablo Picasso, who had come from Barcelona to see it. The Gare d'Orsay was the last of its kind, but this, the Gare Saint-Lazare, was the first of the great railway stations established in Paris. It opened in 1837 and was successively altered and enlarged. The version we see today is basically the version created in 1867 in time for another huge spectacular world fair, the Universal Exhibition of 1867. In the year of its opening, an estimated 25 million passengers, passengers passed through this station. The technology of steam, the science of thermodynamics, had transformed transport, work, production, and urban living in the 19th century, and those changes continued apace. The technology based on thermodynamics on uh, steam engines was the leading edge of the industrial revolution and its characteristic byproduct, its insignia, the insignia of modernity itself was smoke and steam. We've established a relationship between the railway stations and the Universal Exhibitions that were held in Paris. And we'll be returning to consider the Universal Exhibition of 1867. But before we do that, we should pause to consider these train stations and what they portend. First and foremost, they convey an unprecedented influx of people into the urban center. And in so doing, they alter the character of the urban center, but most particularly, they alter the character of the immediately surrounding area, which adapts to and seeks to exploit the bonanza of all this passing trade. Unlike the structured, calibrated demographic of a settled neighborhood, the transient population that flooded out of the railway stations was totally varied and mixed. It was a mass and through their temporary displacement and through the anonymity that this afforded, people coming into Paris could enter a make-believe world. That's what some of them certainly felt. Here was a mass with disposable income, looking for diversion, looking for novelty, looking for kicks. Their predisposition for finding excitement in the city and in the immediate surroundings of the railway stations fueled some of the great transformations of Paris in the 19th century and made it par excellence a city of spectacle. Two paintings by Camille Pizarro, painted from uh, hotel room windows, showing uh, the uh, urban bustle in front of the Gare Saint-Lazare. The trains coming into the Gare Saint-Lazare weren't only conveying passengers, of course, 
they were also bringing in goods and thereby ensuring the great spectacle of variety and abundance whose aim was to attract and dazzle this transient mixed mass populace. These paintings by Pissarro and others he painted from the same location show the animation of the streets adjacent to the Dark Saint Lazare. But uh, earlier in 1874, Pissarro and a group of artists who would subsequently become known as the Impressionists held their first exhibition on the Boulevard des Capucines, a mere five minutes on foot from the entrance to the railway station. Here you have uh, two antique postcards of the uh, Boulevard des Capucines and uh, on the right uh, a photograph of the studio of uh, Felix Nadar, which was where the Impressionists held their first exhibition. And from the balcony on, on the second floor, uh, uh, Claude Monet painted uh, two canvases representing the street down below, the pedestrians and the traffic of horses and carriages in perpetual motion. Either or both of these paintings were included in the first Impressionist exhibition, where they were an invitation to gallery visitors to match the evidence of their eyes, looking down at the street, seeing the same view with Monet's representation. The animated fleeting character of the scene would help them understand, would provide the justification for Monet's rapid, fragmentary notation. Monet's optimistic faith that his viewers would understand and admire was completely misplaced, of course. Generally, uh, the viewers uh, of the first Impressionist exhibition were bewildered and appalled by these disconnected dashes and dabs, which struck most of them as a catastrophic disintegration of vision and a crushing of all sense data to the level of insignificance. Their dismay is perfectly comprehensible, of course, even if we no longer see those paintings in the same way. Three years later in 1877, Monet painted seven variations of the motif of steaming locomot locomotives in the Gare Saint Lazare, which he exhibited as a group in the third Impressionist exhibition, this time held in the Rue Le Peltier. And once again, the venue was within easy walking distance of the Gare Saint Lazare. Again, there was an implicit invitation for you to match your visual experience, your visual memory with the vision of the painter. And here, smoke and steam, the insignia of the Industrial Revolution and by association of modernity are put right in the foreground. And the effect of this is to envelop, obscure, interrupt, and fragment the appearance of determinate things. We know that a steam engine is black and weighs several tons, but here it is a flimsy, disconnected, dissolving apparition. There's an almost identifiable human figure fluttering away like everything else into a meaningless shambles. And then this amazing transition where all that is solid melts into air. Nothing can be isolated. Nothing is graspable. There's nothing you could name. This effect of estrangement, where a familiar scene becomes atomized and indeterminate, uh, approximates in our vision to something swarming, thronging, a mass, we could call it a mass effect. And for the Impressionists, this kind of mass effect is a keynote of their feeling for modernity. And so too from 
for Walter Benjamin, that wonderful writer about whom we'll have more to say presently. Walter Benjamin gives us the poetic figure, the simile we require to explain this phenomenon. He wrote, the crowd was the veil from behind which the familiar city as phantasmagoria beckoned to the beholder. The crowd is the veil, so we might say that the swarming effect in Impressionist painting is a metaphor or an afterimage of the crowded thoroughfares and the pulsating energies of the metropolis. Somehow related to this sensation of massing and transitoriness, the familiar city seems to become phantasmagoria. And that is precisely the phenomenon we'll be examining in this lecture. Here are two paintings by Camille Pissarro depicting the Boulevard Montmartre. Once again, the motif is a mere stone's throw away from the Gare Saint-Lazare on the boundary between the 8th and 9th arrondissement. As you will discover, it was once the very epicenter of Paris as a city of spectacle. Pissarro painted these views uh, from the balcony of a hotel room. The uh, hotel was called the Hotel de la Grande Russie. It no longer exists, but here's a view from street level. What you can see today looking in the same direction. At the beginning of the 19th century, during Napoleon's reign, this was where the city of Paris petered out into open fields and small farming plots, traversed by a roadway heading north to a still rustic village on a hill, Montmartre. You'd take the left here at the McDonald sign to get there. The Boulevard Montmartre wasn't a boulevard at all then. It was a muddy thoroughfare, but it sprang to life because of a couple of unique implantations. About 150 meters up to the right, Napoleon established a theater, the Théâtre des Variétés, which is there to this day. This painting by Jean Bérard, painted at nearly the same time that Pissarro uh, was painting his views of the Boulevard Montmartre. This uh, shows the blaze of lights of the Théâtre des Variétés across the road and a typical crowd of boulevardiers uh, milling around. What is a boulevardier, you may ask? A boulevardier is someone all dressed up like these gents, someone who is manifestly on show, somebody who takes on a somewhat theatrical character. The boulevardier is an adult consenting to participate in the spectacle of life in the city streets. Different views of exactly the same spot, a hot spot of the city of spectacle and brightly lit on the opposite side of the street, you see the facade of a theater, the uh, Théâtre des Variétés. The Théâtre des Variétés Varieté was established here in 1806 as an alternative to the serious classic highbrow theater of the Palais Royal. Its aim was to provide an outlet for lighter popular entertainment, operetta, vaudeville, dramatizations of successful novels, farce, and so on. And right next to this building were two rotundas, which you can see here. Uh, these opened to the public a little earlier in 1800 and were a great success in pulling the crowds and in gaining prominence for the area. Each of these rotundas housed a huge painting that wound around 360 degrees. One of the paintings depicted Paris, seen over its rooftops 
the other depicted the port of Toulon. These were called panoramas, and they were the sensation of Paris during the 30 years of their existence. The rotundas were dismantled in 1831, but the arcade that ran between them remained an important landmark. The popularity of the panoramas came to be challenged by another novelty, which was created uh, by a painter by the name of Louis Daguerre, who used his experience creating theater sets and collaborating with architects to create panoramic setups that took things a, a good deal further. They were even more illusionistic and they entailed movement and changes of lighting and also some sort of narrative or anecdotage which uh, made up a, a performance lasting 10 to 15 minutes. These spectacles were called dioramas and the first of them was launched uh, in custom built premises in uh, 1822. The canvases Daguerre used were enormous, 7.3 meters wide and 6.4 meters tall. As uh, the commemorative plaque in, in the building tells us, uh, Louis Daguerre went on to invent a new species of photograph, the daguerreotype, uh, in the very year that his diorama burnt to the ground. These uh, spectacular novelties, the panorama and the diorama, uh, left their trace on Balzac's great novel, Le Père Goriot. The popular taste for this kind of diversion is ascribed by Balzac in this novel to pathological disturbances in society, to the corruption of morals in effect. Le Père Goriot is set in post-Napoleonic France in the year 1819. The protagonist, Père Goriot, had made a fortune during the aftermath of the French Revolution, when the Parisians were without bread Goriot imported pasta from Italy and his prices rocketed when bread and flour became scarce. However, this windfall led directly to his tragic misfortune. Père Goriot was like a modern day King Lear. He had two awful daughters, uh, Anastasie and Delphine, who were the equivalents of Goneril and Regan, heartless, self-serving vixens who had married into the aristocracy with their colossal dowries, stripping, stripping their father of his wealth and reducing him to poverty, their callous treatment of him, leaving him a broken man. The illustration on the right depicts the courtyard of the Pension Vauquer, the boarding house where Père Goriot lives. There is a visitor, a young painter, who instructs the inmates of the boarding house about a, a new Parisian fashion of talking about everything in terms of Rama. Well, Monsieur Poiré, how is your health of Rama? The suffix of Rama gets attached to many words and most outrageously of all, to death itself. Mor Mortorama, death of Rama. Panoramas, dioramas correspond to the mounting appetite for thrills, sensations, distractions. That's what Balzac infers to his readers. The dawning of an age of mass consumption the society of spectacle has arrived and its symptoms are the exacerbation of thoughtlessness, heartlessness, heedlessness, selfishness and nihilism. The terrible suffering of Père Goriot is the outcome of these developments 
which Balzac links to the malaise of other characters as well. Their alienation, their nostalgia for bygone times, for times that were more humane and decent, their intensely pessimistic view of the unfolding logic of modernity, all of this makes the characters and their social relationships so shockingly and brutally recognizable to readers two centuries later. Let it be said as well that uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were passionate readers of Balzac's novels and they marveled at his diagnostic powers, uh, how he linked his understanding of social behavior and human interest to economic conditions. Balzac had witnessed the headlong development of these new unprecedented commercial enterprises in Paris, which were a direct result of a glut of manufactured goods flooding into this city. The industrial revolution, mass production, the factory system, the far-flung colonies of the Western European nations, and the massively expanded world markets. These uh, all uh, were inexorably, inexorably uh, transforming the streets of Paris. The great poem of display chants its stanzas of color from the church of La Madeleine to the Porte Saint-Denis, Balzac exclaimed. The new Paris was a poem of display and its stanzas, those of them that remain to this day, uh, are marked in red on this map. They are the covered passages, the arcades of Paris. Today we can see the likes of these shopping arcades in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, London, Naples, Milan. But the, the prototypes for these arcades first appeared in Paris and were the stanzas of Balzac's great poem of display. By the 1850s, there were approximately 150 covered passages or shopping arcades in Paris versus the dozen or so that have survived. The surviving ones do indeed extend from La Madeleine to the Porte Saint-Denis. Uh, here you see the, uh, the Passage de la Madeleine and the now very scruffy, the Passage Brady, which is near the Porte Saint-Denis. The best known of these covered shopping arcades then and now was the Passage des Panorama, which uh, adjoined the twin rotundas of the panoramas and was right next to the Théâtre des Variétés. Here is the entrance to the, uh, on the Boulevard Montmartre uh, of the Passage des Panorama. And uh, it looks like this in the interior. It's a quaint backwater, but you have to remember uh, this passage is more than 200 years old. It was built in 1800. Once upon a time, viewers were stunned by its opulence, which you can infer from some of the surviving evidence. We're examining uh, in, a, in a Parisian arcade of this vintage, the archeology span of our modern commercial culture. Uh, I hope you understand, while tracing at the same time the evolution of Paris as a glamorous modern capital, as a city of spectacle. And the inspiration and guide for our investigation is the one and only Walter Benjamin, whose masterpiece of social history, The Arcades Project, analyzes the tremendous significance of these arcades in Paris in the 19th century. It may be that the passage of Paris derived from marketplaces of the East, such as you see here, the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, established by Sultan Mehmed II in 1455. 
But there was also a precedent in Paris itself, the earliest shopping precinct of all. Built in 1786, three years before the outbreak of the French Revolution. It was built for the Duc d'Orléans, the brother of Louis XVI, in the gardens of his domicile, the Palais Royal. It was instantly a great draw card for the public and a desirable location for shopkeepers. It became a popular place for passeggiata, for strolling, browsing, seeing, and being seen. The Parisians you would uh, encounter promenading in and around the Gare du Bois, the wooden gallery in the middle of the Palais Royal, uh, came, the, the gardens of the Palais Royal, came from all walks of life. And uh, it wasn't only the commodities in the shops that could be bought and sold, it was people, it was women as well. One of the, uh, one of the results of this uh, spontaneous mixing of people in the Gare du Bois and under the awnings of the Palais Royal during uh, the three years following their opening to the public and uh, the, during these same three years preceding the outbreak of the French Revolution, there was an intensification of conversations in the cafes and restaurants, the spread of gossip and rumor, criticism, complaint, and seditious talk. The spark that ignited the French Revolution is thought to have occurred in exactly this spot in the cafe under the awnings of the Palais Royal. One of the habitués, Camille Desmoulins, gave a fiery impromptu oration, which led to a riot. This happened on the 12th of July, 1789, two days before the storming of the Bastille. In some curious and completely decisive way, the revolution served to extinguish the spectacular character of the royal court and the ostentation of the aristocratic lifestyle, uh, transferring not only political and economic power, to a new breed of speculative capitalists, but also an ability to muster fabulous resources in order to create new forms of spectacle. Let's take as an example, 1867, the year that the expanded Gare Saint-Lazare reopened and when the Universal Exhibition took place in Paris on the Champ de Mars. This was a, a spectacle on an absolutely astounding scale, the Orama to beat all other Oramas. There were 42 nations represented in the exhibition. The image on the right shows the stand representing Cambodia and featuring a stuffed elephant. The exhibition ran for seven months and attracted 9,238,000 967 visitors, some of whom were no doubt exhibitors, uh, people who came several times, or maybe administrators and cleaning staff, but quibbling over the tally of visitors can't make much of a dent in that whopping statistic of more than 9 million entries. The Universal Exhibition featured a gigantic art exhibition and this shows one of the galleries. I'm not sure how many paintings were exhibited, but it would certainly be more than a thousand. The important art exhibitions in Paris, the salons, never had less than a thousand paintings on view. Sometimes there were as many as 5,000. A previous universal exhibition held in 1855 featured 5,000 works shown in the Palais des Beaux-Arts and seen by an estimated 900,000 visitors. There were 4,097 exhibits in the Salon of 1861, 2,217 in 1863, 2,457 
1874. So we have an idea of the stupendous scale of these events and also of the stupendous size of the viewing public. Salon visitors in the 1870s were normally around half a million. On days when entry to the Salon was free, there were normally about 20,000 visitors. The contents of these exhibitions were vetted by a jury, usually, uh, or, or for the most part, composed of academicians. Their aim was to maintain consistency and uphold the standards of proficiency that were recognized by the academy. If you visit the Musée d'Orsay, you can see a great array of works by the most popular and sought after stars of the Salon, whose works were acquired by the state or were bought by millionaire, millionaire collectors for the equivalent prices of a Damien Hirst or a Jeff Koons today. But we'll leave off at this point uh, and conclude part one of this lecture on Paris City of, of Spectacle. There is more to follow in part two.